Peace and love, everyone. My name is Andrew Hewson. I'm a spiritual teacher. I'm back with my friend, David Davidja Buckland. David is an author and a practitioner of the spiritual uh, tradition of yoga in the most essential sense uh, of what that term points to. And uh, we have been getting together to have conversations surrounding the subject of spiritual unfoldment, uh, in particular, the stages of realization and how various topics relate to that unfoldment and the possible perspectives that can be held in the midst of that and various challenges uh, that could potentially arise and ways to uh, be with the process in a more effective, efficient, smooth way. So we're here uh, today gathered to uh, speak about the subject of healing, uh, resolving material as a process through the unfoldment of realization. And uh, I'm grateful to be back with you, David. Well, thank you, Andrew. Yes, I'm happy to be here too. And it's uh, healing is such a key topic on the spiritual journey even the human journey as a whole. Mm. I mean, we're all familiar with, you know, uh, cutting ourselves or, or scraping ourselves and, and healing physically. And our culture is very good at supporting that. But it's much less oriented towards supporting healing, uh, energetic, emotional uh, challenges and uh, mental challenges, uh, unresolved uh, stuff in the, uh, on those different uh, levels of our experience. And so today we're going to be talking something about that and things we, that you can do to support your journey. Yeah, that's really beautiful, David. Um, I think one of the most fundamental understandings as we move into this is that we're really dealing in um, an accumulation of material that has arisen through a fundamental misperception of what we actually are. So in this misperception of our nature and this um, identification with content, form, and experience in a way that appears to be separate and limited, we begin to accumulate impressions. And there's a lot of um, resistance mechanisms that are in place that uh, tend to support that accumulation and its perpetuation. So we're not necessarily talking about healing what appear to be uh, stories or happenings, but the residue of the impressions of what our experience of that seem to be uh, at a given point. Right. When there is a, when experience arises that we don't understand in some way, or we're not, we don't know how to process in, in an effective way, the habit of resisting those experiences tends to arise. Uh, there's also the the tendency to grasp at what we want mm -hmm. that experiences are inherently come and go but there can be the tendency to try and grasp and hold on to experiences that we want um, and then similarly to resist experiences we don't want so rather than emotions rising up in, in our experience and being being experienced processed and clearing completing uh, we resist them and try to suppress them and so they don't complete and they stick around uh, as an unresolved experience. Hmm. Yeah, that's really beautiful. I've, I've often used the example of, a, of the animal kingdom to, to look at sort of the natural release of, of certain energies and, and it's been used elsewhere as well. And one of my favorite examples is an example of uh, a fox and a rabbit. In, in the case of the fox and the rabbit, one appears to be the predator and the other appears to be the prey. And although there's no verbal uh, conceptual processing in, in the same way that there is, at least in the human kingdom, the, the rabbit naturally innately um, feels that the, the fox is uh, the predator. And so in the presence of their meeting, there is an inclination to run away from the fox. And in that running away, there may appear to be a rush of adrenaline, the heart starts to beat faster. And from our perception, we could say that the rabbit is afraid. It doesn't want to be eaten. It wants to continue to live. It wants to survive. But 
because the rabbit isn't thinking of itself as a me, as a, a rabbit that's experiencing this as a, as a separate entity, uh, that energy just runs through the, the, the physiology of the rabbit in a certain sense. It has a, um, doesn't have that same blockage point um, that is present in the self-definition uh, that arises with the, the human body and mind. So there's, there's a possibility for recognizing where uh, instead of allowing something as it arises to, to release naturally and to express out of the, out of the physiology, um, there's a resistance to it. And when we recognize where that resistance point is, then that opens up the possibility for um, a release of that sort of spontaneous movement to attempt to control. So we can begin to witness a relaxation of that crystallization of an attempt to control what is being reflected back in conscious awareness. And we all have that uh, capacity. We all have that intelligence innate within our being. Yes, I, and I've noticed two uh, examples of um, wild animals after a chase um, kind of scenario or, or an apparently stressful situation that they'll literally shake it off. Mm -hmm. They'll kind of dance around a little bit and, and you know, and that they'll, they'll clear that, that energy and shift back into their, their uh, normal state. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, there isn't a resistance uh, taking place. And the, the trick is too, we might not be conscious of this resistance at all at first. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, indeed we may have taken on energetically some of these resistance patterns in the womb uh, mm -hmm. because it, it's, it was our, uh, family heritage in a kind of a way uh, where, where, you know, there's been a history of uh, resistance patterns in our culture. And so, it, you know, we pass them, we pass them on uh, and we want to be able to, when we're born, we want to be able to fit in with our family environment and, and how our family deals with things. And so it's natural. It's a natural process to take on those resistance patterns. But if we stop and look at our experience, um, we can start to recognize where there's uh, where there's a reactivity. Uh, it's not just feeling the emotion, but there's a reactivity to the emotion, a resistance uh, for, uh, to the emotion arising uh, to the experience in some way. Uh, we may have a story about it too that says, oh, this is bad in some way. Mm. Uh, and in some, you know, certainly uh, we, we're, we're not going to want to experience the heavier emotions if we can avoid them. And there's going to be some, a light resistance to, to them arising and yet at the same time uh if we don't allow them and let them complete they're going to dominate um, they're going to dominate our our uh, experience for a while and, and they kind of it's like um um oh, we have a good example but we we um say we we have a uh, eckhart tolle gives the example of seeing someone kick a dog it's natural mm -hmm. to experience anger as a result of that but then we can uh, act to do something to uh, stop it or, or whatever we do, but the, we can let the anger complete. But if we just kind of like, oh, that was bad, and we, blah, 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 and blah, and we then what happens is it kind of sits there in our system looking for a way to complete, and it keeps regurgitating up again. And we tell the story about how, oh, this is the, this, I saw this person doing this thing, this is this bad, and, and becomes a whole theme for a while. And, and when we do this repeatedly with many experiences over the course of our lives, we built a, we can build a fair bit of back, backlog. And what's fascinating about this too, is it's really closely related to karma. Mm -hmm. Karma means action. And karma in this context is essentially those actions that have not completed, those, those actions, those events that have, have arisen, but not been fully processed and, and completed. And so they're sitting there in our physiology in an uh, incomplete state, waiting for an opportunity to, to arise and be completed. And so that creates this cycle where they keep coming up over and over again, sometimes repeatedly in a short period of time, sometimes occasionally over a longer period of time, whenever uh, it's suitable for that to arise. Yeah, that's a really beautiful uh, couple of points you just made there, David. The first one, I found fascinating was that uh, we've 
really in a way collectively become desensitized to the recognition of resistance or the attempt to control experience because everyone um, seems to be in a mode of attempting to control their experience or at least the majority <laughs> does uh, on this on this planet that is uh, adopted as a as a natural way of being and, and something that actually allows us to more effectively and efficiently navigate through life but actually it's quite the opposite what ends up taking place is that through that attempt to control the experience we end up with a lot of that uh, backlog, we end up accumulating uh, these incomplete uh, expressions of spontaneous arising because we have this sense that we are a local doer and, and that we do have control over what is taking place. And when we begin to become more conscious, we begin to recognize that attempt to control. So it's not necessarily that something is not going to arise and that there won't be resistance to it, but what takes place when we see that there is that sort of spontaneous tendency to lock down and attempt to control what is arising. When we see that tendency to try to control what's arising, right there, there's a threshold point where we can begin to collapse into an allowing. And that's really what healing and resolution boils down to, is an attentive, conscious allowing of these areas of experience which have not been allowed. Exactly. Yeah. It's a, such a and it's such a key thing because this is not just in terms of, of uh, spiritual progress, but in terms of our just simple quality of life. All these resisted experiences are sitting there in, in the background as a kind of a, a weight. And it can even actually feel like a weight on your shoulders. Um, and, it, and it tends to even has this this uh, tendency where it's kind of chuffed down, where there, we kind of build up these layers like an onion uh, of protection of uh, trying to keep these these uh, details suppressed. And so you know, sometimes it can be a little bit like peeling an onion as we as we clear these things and come down to the core uh, compression. Um, and it's, it creates this kind of shadow effect on our life. And so the richness and, and quality of life just for day-to-day -day living uh, is covered up. Mm. Uh, our, our nature as you know, clear consciousness and as bliss is covered up by mm. all this unresolved baggage. And sometimes it's kind of like um, in the way organic matter, you know, buried for a long time under pressure, turns into oil, uh, the same kind of a thing when we have these contractions that we're, we're keeping contracted over a long period of time, it can kind of turn into this energetic sludge, mm -hmm. uh, depending on the type of contraction and type of energy and so on. But, you know, it just kind of plugs up the works, so to speak, energetically. And again, re reduces the richness and, and uh, quality of life in the process. Yeah, that's a really beautiful point, David. I tend to uh, call that sludge energetic condensation. And I look at it as basically just a, a condensation of, of conscious awareness that is based in this fundamental misperception or this, this limited reflection of I in the functioning of the body and the mind. And so it's important to recognize that that sludge or that condensation is actually structured in limited identity. That means it directly relates back to the, the limited sense of self. And so it can there can be a lot of defense mechanisms surrounding the release or the resolution of that energy uh, because it, uh, in a way, is associated with what we've taken ourselves to be. And we see all of these different layers coming together to um, present this uh, self story or this, this, sense of, this, this sense of me. And when those layers start to, to be resolved and released, then... Um, that, that limited local sense of operation uh, and the identification that is with that is really uh, being undone. And so now what's taking place is we're transitioning into, uh, as you said, a clear, uh, bright recognition of the truth of what we actually are. Uh, but at the same time, there's something within our experience which doesn't really want that to happen. So it's helpful to, to recognize that there are certain uh, defense mechanisms that can arise that actually are attempting to, to support the continuance of, of those unresolved 
uh, layers of energy. Yes, I agree. And it's also a, um, it's also a real energy drain because all that suppression and control takes energy, mm -hmm. a constant, a constant energy uh, to, to maintain. And so as we let it go, we release that the energy that was required to maintain it. And that becomes available for, for, for life and just in mm -hmm. general. So yes, it's, it's a, it's an interesting dance because uh, it's kind of like changing habits that don't want to be changed mm -hmm. and changing ways of being that, that have some resistance to change. And yet the little dance is worth it. I mean, we don't want to get into it. And one of the hazards with, with a, an energy healing style is another control mechanism. Mm. So we, we start to use another way of manipulating our experience. Uh, the energy te uh, healing techniques is another way to manipulate our experience. So this isn't about new ways of control. It's about letting go of control. And it can mm -hmm. take a little bit of a back and forth to find our way through that and into, into a smooth, smooth flow and, uh, and letting go of those habits. But as we get clearer and clearer, they become more and more clear. And as we step back into that deeper nature, uh, then we see through it much more and uh, it's easier to see and it's easier to release. So it's just kind of this uh, process. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it also has a, a, a tendency to be influenced by the cycles of time. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's various qualities of time that become more dominant at some times and, and less so at other times. And so there's certain times where say uh, issues about anger are going to come to the surface more and other times where fear is going to be more prevalent in the, in the experience or anxiety or something like that. It kind of depends. And sometimes we can see that in the collective. Um, there's a, uh, at the current time, there's been a lot of uh, collective fear coming to the surface and, and being processed by people. And some are acting that out and some are seeing the fear and don't know what to do with it. And some are, uh, have some of these basic principles. And so they're able to see the fear and be with it. And, and allow it to complete and clear. And so they, those people become part of the, of the solution, part of the, of the uh, clearing of the collective and, of, um, and for themselves uh, personally. Yeah, that's a really beautiful point. There's so much to cover there. I wanna go back to uh, what you were saying about energy and how that uh, those, those layers of, of unresolved material can, can be energy draining. And uh, they, when they're sitting there and, uh, and sort of compressing, if you will, then they actually begin to turn into, in a way, a sort of an oil uh, or, or something that is um, continually becoming more dense uh, as, as it just uh, rests in that sticky. unresolved space. Sticky, it's yeah. Sticky yeah. too, yeah. It has a clingy, it's sort of like that, that identification quality in there. It has a kind yes, of exactly. It's structured in that. Uh, yeah. And, and when it surfaces, it tends to sort of um, reflect that, uh, that identification quality up into the body and mind as well. But one uh, perspective, which I favor is, is looking at this condensated conscious awareness or this condensate, condensated energetic layering as a fuel of sorts. Uh, so that when we are aligned uh, with this uh, vast intelligence of, of ourself and its, and its innate, spontaneous, evolutionary uh, direction towards revealing itself to itself and, and recognizing the truth of its own uh, pure divinity, then what can begin to take place is that, that sludge or oil or very, very dense or thick material uh, can actually be recognized as that which has the potential to burn the brightest. We can see that in this <laughs> world, oil is, oil is seen to be valuable. And we recognize that it has that potential to burn very hot um, within a certain context. And it has that potential to brighten and light up um, or, you know, that which seems to surround it. So as we are uh, attentively allowing uh, the resolution of this energy with, with a non-controlling um, wisdom of, of just surrender, giving way uh, into, into what's arising, then we can begin to witness a process of conversion where that unresolved material becomes fuel for the fire of enlightenment. And so we begin to see those layers um, processing in the direction of that brightness, that brilliancy, 
uh, turning up and up and up and up. And as that turns up, the bliss turns up. And as the bliss turns up, that sort of cushions and invites even more of that material to come up. And so it becomes this self-validating, self-confirming process. And as you said, we're learning, you know, the conscious experiencing is learning as it goes. Uh, there's different tendencies that are in place and, and subtle uh, blind, blind spots uh, and, and, and movements to, uh, you know, uh, reject something on the basis of um, what may seem to be a newfound spiritual identity, whatever the case may be, there's all kinds of, of different possibilities. But through grace and that ever clarifying uh, process of that of that fuel burning more brightly, we begin to recognize those things as they're arising. And as they're recognized, we can just flow back in to that natural intelligence of surrender. And we begin to uh, really witness the body and the mind. In a way, I, I, I see it almost as becoming a, a paintbrush of the Supreme. And, and the strokes of the Supreme through the body and mind are, are what are painting the, the portrait of ever refining surrender as human life uh, within the self. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah, so that's the interesting thing about the transforming energy to note in, in there too, is it has that potential, as you say, to burn and transform towards to the light. Mm -hmm. But it also has that tendency and, and the way it's been been there is mm -hmm. that it, it's a kind of a fuel to sustain itself and to move towards the darkness. Yes. So it's kind of thing about transformation. You can transform in, in either way. And yes. so the key is to shift that trend, that tendency from, from, the, um, from the dark to the light, essentially. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. I've looked at it uh, as basically two, two directions. One is the direction of recondensation and, and identification or re-identification, restructuring of the impressions. And then the other direction is where uh, it's in the direction of transcendence, release, evaporation, and, and resolution. Yes, and that transcendence is so key because that takes us beyond the mind and emotions into mm. our deeper nature. And that gives us a taste of that greater sense of self. Mm. But it also softens the grip of, of these past shadows. And it, it sees we're, we're greater than... Um, the story of, of our uh, our me, our our thoughts and our, our our emotions. That's not who we are. They're just what we're experiencing. They're just part of the content of our experience. And then we take them a little less seriously, and then it's much easier to let them go and just allow them to be there and, and release. Beautiful, beautiful. I think it would be helpful also to to mention how this this healing um, and resolution. Uh, transmutative aspect of of the unfoldment relates to the feminine uh, uh, aspect of, of our reality and and yeah. how that shows up in the different um, qualitative shifts that that uh, that shine forth in you know as this uh, unfoldment of enlightenment is is revealing itself. There can be a tendency on the on the masculine side of things to feel. Um, pretty well resolved in, in certain stages. <laughs> and, uh, and that's, there's several different reasons for that. One of it, one of them is because there, the, the lively, liveliness isn't really churning, churning the pot so much. So we're the, the, the silence and the stillness is more of a dominant point of reference. And it is, tends to feel a little bit more removed from the whole process of experiencing and, and the appearance of the world, et cetera. Yes. So in the, in those conditions and, and oftentimes in the teachings that you see sort of coming from a masculine dominant condition, uh, there, there can be very little emphasis on, on, on resolution um, or even very little ability to recognize that there's anything there to be resolved. Yeah. So as a part and of the process, go even to dismiss it altogether. Yeah, to dismiss it altogether. Yeah. And that's one of the that's one of the self limiting uh, temptations or sort of options that seems to arrive um, as things are unfolding. So it's important to know that, yeah, we can feel that way. We can feel like, wow, you know, this is it. There's not it's just pure infinite stillness. Nothing. There's not, you know, resolve what? Um, 
And uh, we can feel that way <laughs> multiple times, uh, but that doesn't mean that that's actually the case, you know, and I would consider it to be a temporary stage. And I would tell anybody that is tasting that just to remain open uh, and willing to go through whatever it is that uh, is seen or unseen in that, in that condition, because as things continue to unfold uh, and the feminine uh, aspect does come online uh, in a richer and fuller way, then that churning, that flow, uh, begins to reveal some of that unresolved material. And we could say that the power, the power of the feminine is what really allows for that uh, to shine forth because that power is supportive, not only of the seeing of that material, but also of the ability to hold it in a way which uh, is in alignment with, with its intelligent resolution. Yes. And, and the, the key thing too, is that if that feminine process is not supported in some way, if there, there is a resistance or denial of the need for any healing, then there's, of course, there's the acting out issues and so on like mm -hmm. that, that you see in many spiritual communities. But also it means that the feminine side of the process, all that refinement of perception and the awakening heart and, and uh, the profound uh, universal flows of love and compassion and all those yeah. sorts of aspects are just not on the table. They're just, mm. they're not there. And, you know, you see people who are quite clearly awake, denying that there's bliss or yes. denying that, that, that uh, there's any qualities of the divine around. It's just yeah. this flat kind of very dry uh, unfolding. And, and, you know, that's where the healing has its role. It's, it's very, very important to bring out the other side of the equation. Yeah, it is. It's really interesting that uh, in, in those masculine conditions where there is just a sort of a flatness, a dryness, um, uh, uh, just a peacefulness, yeah. what, what is missing uh, or, or what we could recognize as missing if we have, have tasted um, the, other, the other side of the process is that 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 material, you know, hasn't had the opportunity uh, to be cleared and, and converted into that lively recognition of the fullness and the richness uh, of, of life, of, of the reality of, of this field of, of ourself. And so it doesn't mean that it's not there. It just means that uh, for whatever reason, mm, uh, the willingness to, to embrace the possibility that there is material there to be cleared and, and converted, uh, perhaps just hasn't, uh, has seen, seemed to have become dormant. Yeah. Yes, and it's very, and it's a critical thing. I mean, I've seen teachers, uh, people who have been my friends, mm. who's, who have had material come to the surface and start acting it out with their students. Mm. And rather than and being told that they were doing it, you know, having it pointed out to them. And rather than being receptive, they were dismissive and they felt them, they were beyond all that and better than that or, or whatever the dynamic was. And so there's, there was an un unwillingness to, to see what was taking place and acting it out. And I've been quite surprised by that. A number of people now I've seen in, in higher stages where there has been very clear uh, development in consciousness but still some shadows and and that's natural that's we still like our life is kind of in this uh cycle of time mm. um like one of the traditional understandings about karma is that there's these three types the our backlog the suitcase we bring into this life uh, of seeds of of of, of action to, to uh, and events to take place in our life experiences to come and then the new karmas we create, the new unfinished business we create in this lifetime. And one of the, the key aspects of the awakening process is because we break that identification with the, the me, it also severs the identification with all that backlog, that mm. history of, of uh, unresolved experiences from our past. And, and then it stops the tendency or dramatically winds down the tendency over time of, of the t to create new karma, you know, assuming the resistance has fallen away and so on. Um, so what we're left with is the, what, what are known as the sprouted seeds, that suitcase 
has kind of a schedule that unfolds through the cycles of time in our life. And so even the very, very awake and very, very clear who are, who are doing healing and that kind of stuff, will still have stuff come up. Of course. And there'll still be uh, things to process. And if they're being conscious and, and they understand these principles, uh, they're going to engage that and, and deal with it. Hmm. Um, the, the, the hazard is when they, they're not and, yes. uh, and they don't deal with it. And then it, then it becomes, then they're basically creating new karmas and, and, uh, and reinforcing old things and, and so forth. They're not completing the process which can have long-term uh, consequences as well. Yes, yes, it can. It's, uh, it's such a vital point to recognize uh, that there's two aspects to, to a very comprehensive unfoldment. That's realization, but there's also resolution. And if we have one without the other, there's going to um, be some, some difficulties that seem to arise. I mean, there, there, are, there are some in the spiritual marketplace that sort of attempt to counter um, the more masculine side of things by you know being very much about the the resolution side but at the same time they may not always be situated in in the recognition and the realization of what they are so yeah. it's important to have that clear shift and to and to see ourself as we are and beyond but at the same time uh without the without the resolution that that's going to uh uh, still be a limited, uh, a limited phase, a limited stage. And on the other side of things, we can really give a lot of attention to resolution, but our ability to really even see what is there is concealed by the limited sense of self. So until we begin to really tune in to the, the realization of our reality as, as infinite, a lot of, uh, a lot of concealed material stays concealed. Yeah. 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 And it, and it limits the, the potential. Hmm. Yeah. The, uh, how uh, the unfolding can, can progress. And the, and right back again to a practical level, the quality of life. Yes. And, and the, the, the value of what you've got. Another, another point in here too, to, to note is that uh, a clear awakening increases the power of your attention. Hmm. And so it, it greatly facilitates the processing and clearing. Yes. However, it also greatly uh, increases the impact of not processing and, and suppressing it. <laughs> so, so it actually can create more difficult uh, karmas, mm -hmm. more difficult uh, baggage. Yes. So it's, yeah, uh, yeah, a great it's, point. it's a bit of a dance. So I thought it might be useful to talk about the process a little bit, just in a, yes. not in a formal kind of way. There are certainly energy healers uh, like our friend Dorothy Rowe. Nice. who teach uh, a, a more formal process. And that can be very valuable if this is new to you and you're just learning the process. Uh, so you have a bit of a step-by-step -step approach to take to walk you through the process until it becomes more natural and, and uh, habitual. But essentially, the first part is recognizing when we're resisting. Noticing that there's... You're having an experience, but there's some <clears throat> resistance to the experience in there. There's a mix, it, it's usually kind of mixed in. Um, so that's the first step. And then it's the learning to allow whatever is arising. Mm -hmm. So stepping back a little bit into, a, into presence, into witness, consciousness, however you want to frame that, however you experience it, being able to step back a little bit so you're not in it and then allow whatever is arising. So it's that learning to let go of resistance. That's, that's the key part of it. Learning to see it and then let it go. And it's kind of a surrendering control because we, the, keeping in mind here, that sense of personal me that's in control is an illusion. Mm. There is a person here who is a vehicle of experience, but that's not what's in control. That's just the ego's mechanism for trying to manage this uh, life when we're out of touch with our deeper nature. But once we get to know who our, our deeper nature, then we don't need to have that, that uh, ego trying to control everything. <laughs> it's actually kind of getting in the way. Um, so it's really closely tied into to that identif ego identification. So again, awakening really helps this process. But we don't have to wait to awaken to, to uh, make progress. 
learning these things is really valuable and can actually help the awakening process uh, take yeah, place. Yeah. I mean, for me, uh, one of the really interesting things happened is I, I watched the, actually The Secret, the movie version of The Secret. And in there, this guy talks about uh, culture and gratitude and not as making a mood, but just noticing here and there in the day, things to be grateful for. Um, the, the idea here is you carry a little rock around in your pocket, so you notice it here and there. And and, um, um, and just, oh, what you know, thinking of something different to be grateful for. And it just kind of shifted the habitual tone of mm. my emotional energy just a little bit. And that allowed uh, the healing. A couple of big um, contractions came to the surface after that. Uh, that I was able to see and process. And and that basically set the stage for a clarity needed to awaken. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And so when we're noticing an emotion arising, there can be uh, just a kind of a feeling into it. Uh, we may want, we may find it useful to name it. Uh, it might come as a sensation or in the body or, or an emotion. And sometimes um, the attention will go to some place in the body when we're just feeling into it. It'll move somewhere, and that can that attention can help facilitate the release because sometimes it has a, a physical counterpart stored in the body, and we just allow it to express, not to be involved in it, just to notice it and see it and let it complete, or as best you can. I mean, sometimes it's a really big one. You kind of release a little bit, let the steam off a bit or whatever, and then we come back to it again a bit later. And again, this isn't about trying to control the experience. It isn't about constant monitoring and watching for every little thing. Uh, it's just noticing when it when some more important experience comes up and there's some noticing some resistance that's arising with it, and then learning to be with that and uh, surrender into it. Um, and this allow it, allows it to uh, complete. Yeah, that's really beautiful, David. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's a couple of, uh, you know, practical modalities that uh, I tend to prescribe in, in, in the teaching that comes through here. And the first one is very similar to what, to what you've been describing. It's uh, what I refer to as transmutation. And it's basically just this uh, willingness to attentively allow um, unresolved energy, emotion, and even certain psychological impressions that, that may be arising in correlation with that emotion and that energy. So I look at three basic levels of emergence in the context of, of that, uh, those impressions um, appearing to, to surface into experience. And that's the, the underlying energetic condensation or driver, the uh, associated emotional reflections that are in the body, which there can be multiple emotional reflections associated with one energetic condensation or, or driver. And then there's also typically certain thought processes um, or uh, psychological impressions that, that, associate, that come with um, the surfacing uh, of that material. So we have the opportunity to notice on, on multiple levels. And this of course refines as we continue to, to just simply allow without attempting to control more and more and more. And there's more clearing. And, and in most human beings, it doesn't stop there at the, at the expression of um, mental movements or psychological impressions. It then finds its way into the behavioral sphere. So we see that um, driver expressing all the way through into the, into the sphere of behavioral expression. And sometimes that, you know, that, still will, that will still take place even in the context of those that are um, undergoing shifts. It's not a matter of they're not necessarily being a, um, a reaction or, or saying something a certain way, but what happens when that appears to take place? Do we see the tonality of the voice and, and those kinds of things? So there's just more and more clarity that begins to come online. And with that, the, the opportunity for um, a, an alchemical um, intelligence that is innate to our own conscious awareness to prevail also begins to shine forth so that when we see that there are certain thought processes that have uh, an underlying tone of resistance or anger or fear or whatever the case may be, we can allow the seeing of that then just to um, 
reveal perhaps what's underneath the thought activity. And as, as we uh, are reiterating here over and over, it's not, about, it's not about control. It's about allowing and seeing and releasing and, and opening into. And so as we open into that, we may notice, oh, there is some, some fear, um, some anger, or, um, perhaps a little bit of both in the body. Uh, and, and just opening into that, then we may feel that uh, beginning to, to release or convert or transmute. And, and that allows us to uh, tune into the, to the driver that, that's behind that eventually and um, allow for that energy uh, to process out. And I, I like to look at it as transmutation for the, for the reason that we mentioned earlier in, in the context of fuel, um, fuel for the, for the fire of, of enlightenment, for the fire of devotion, uh, which is a big part of, of what I'm speaking about, just the, you know, the devotion to the process, the devotion to truth. And so that has the potential uh, to, to be converted into that lively, full, um, blissful presence more and more and more and more. And, and that also correlates with the re refinement of the perceptual faculties. And so then our capacity to notice details also comes online in a new way. Yes. And accompanying that transmutative intelligence, I also suggest uh, what I refer to as contemplative supplication which has within it a, um, a process of daily writing. And really the writing is to develop a, an introspective, reflective way of being with, with experience. So that yes, in the immediacy of the arising, there's that non-controlling allowing and things are being released. But if we have periods uh, throughout the day where there is a sitting down to write down what has been observed and reflect on that, we can also begin to tease out some of the details uh, of what has surfaced and, and give, give a space um, for that unconscious material to become more conscious. So we can notice patterns. We can notice certain uh, defense mechanisms. We can notice certain movements of control, which is one of the big things that will, will um, begin to be seen is the, is the attempts to control the subtleties, the residues, uh, of those attempts, so on and so forth. So yes. with uh, just having that, that, that willingness uh, and that, that devotion and that commitment to the path, the commitment to the unfoldment and the commitment to the process itself without trying to get to an imaginary end goal, you know, can be very, very supportive because uh, it enables us to really be with the unfolding in a flexible way, yeah? and embrace those layers of the unconscious uh, becoming conscious as they arise. Yes, I actually uh, journal myself. Uh, that's oh, one beautiful. of the ways I, I find to, it helps process and complete uh, various kinds of things. Um, and sometimes it's like, you know, profound experiences, they don't always make memory impressions. Yes. So if I don't write it down, it's gone. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, as, a, yeah. as a writer, you know, but it's also very valuable for, for processing um, the dynamics that are coming up. Yes. Um, I also wanted to touch on the mind in here too. I, I mentioned in there in the process, uh, it, it may be helpful to be able to name the emotions that are coming up. And and you mentioned too that there can be some uh, story, some some uh, narrative about mm -hmm. what's going on. A um, couple of things in there. One is it's important that we recognize that what's arising can be a mixture of things. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily going to be. So we're not going to have an answer that, oh, this is the stress from when I had the car accident <laughs> in, in 1902. I guess maybe that's a little too far back, but, <laughs> but, but it's not necessarily going to be that specific. It's going to be a mixture of things of similar qualities um, uh, generally. And so we're not going to have the answer. And if the mind's in there trying to figure out what this is and what it's from, it's, it's basically part of the control process and it's getting yes. in the way of the process. Yeah. So naming can be useful. The, the mind is good at naming, but the mind is not good at processing emotions. That's not mm -hmm. the field of the mind. The mind is, is the field of thoughts and mm -hmm. ideas. Uh, emotions are on a, a different level. And so what the mind's trying, if, if you notice that the mind is in there trying to, to process the emotions, it's trying to control. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you have to let that go and just allow the emotions to be there. And then the emotional body will, will process the emotions. That's its job. <laughs> um, 
so you have the mind can see them, but they can't they can't process them. So it's a it's a, an important part of that the way that the the mind gets in there and tries to control in in more subtle ways to uh, manage things. <laughs> yes. But it's it's a it's a letting go. It's 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 an allowing to for things to be as they are and to arise as they are. And it's a it's a different style of being. Mind is very very useful for when it, when it's needed for organizing things and so on. Not so good for letting go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really beautiful points, and it kind of just rem reminded me that the the we we're conditioned initially to try to look for a reason why something is the way that it is. And you know, when I mentioned the the writing, it has nothing to do with that. It's not attempting to find a singular point of origin or a cause. It's 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 recognizing. It's allowing the intelligence uh, of the mind to serve the heart. That's why I call it contemplative supplication, because it has a supplicative uh, intentionality to it, where we're opening into the intelligence of the heart to reveal the the mechanics and the dynamics which are underlying the basic emergence. And and in that we may notice certain uh, you know particular representations of that and the connections there so as you were saying it's off it you know karma or the the, the packages of impressions are cumulative they're not um fragmented and 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 separate and here and this is this and this is this they they're they're sort of a cumulative conglomeration and so we can notice that there's an interconnected web you know uh, surrounding um various things that are arising and and we're not attempting to figure anything out, which has that underlying tonality of trying to control. Instead, we're allowing the intelligence of our own conscious awareness to reveal all of those layers of concealed uh, uh, processes so that more and more we become familiar with uh, the intelligence of, of how impressions work in a certain sense. So in, in a certain sense, we become familiar with the, the intelligence of impressions and how they are developed and how they are resolved. Yeah. Yes, and how they behave in our- And how they behave yeah, and express. How we yeah. you know, have been with them and, and yeah. so on. Yeah, it's like a knowingness or intuition yes. rather than a yes. mind knowing. It's yes. kind of a slightly different style of, of, of being with it. And so it just kind of pops up. And one of the values of journaling or and uh, like that is that when you're writing about it, it kind of, it there's kind of a flow thing that happens, and it just yeah, it's kind of, flow. Yeah. It just kind of comes out as opposed to mind going click, click, click. I mean, mind's in there because <laughs> it's needed to to use words and. Yeah, it's words. about what the mind is serving, you know. Because yes. if the mind's in, it feels like it's in charge. You know, it's going to figure out and <laughs> like that. But if the mind, you know, the mind has the potential to become very refined and to serve this this intelligence of what we are and to serve, you know, the, the flows of love and compassion and, and to serve the heart more fully. And that's what we're really moving into in this, yeah. in this process of healing and resolution. Yes. I have observed also that, that uh, spiritual practices are very, very effective for mm. clearing a lot of this out. Uh, just the being able to step into the transcendence, go beyond the mind and the body, the body, uh, the mind and emotions rather. Well, the body too, mm -hmm. um, into a deep state, and the, the body gets very rested. It goes into a state uh, can be twice as deep as deep sleep, and that's an opportunity for a lot of healing to take place, and just kind of quietly goes. But then, if we get then step into activity, and back into activity again, and those old habits of mind are there, uh, then we just ba basically bring back what some of what we've we've uh, cleared out. We just mm -hmm. reinforce it over and over again. And so um, there's great value in spiritual practices, but what I, what I'm what I suggest from my side is to supplement that with some targeted uh, work when we're, we're noticing that there's some resistance coming up, when we're noticing that we're having trouble with certain kinds of things or certain places uh, where we get into uh, difficulties with certain kinds of relationships or mm. uh, with certain kinds of people or any kind of place where we see there's reactivity in our life uh, where we just where it's like somebody can push our buttons you know that's yes. a sign that there's something in there that hasn't been resolved uh, yes. the neutrality when we're neutral we can remember very difficult experiences uh, 
deep traumas from our past and we can look at them in a somewhat neutral way. I mean, certainly it'll be, you know, the death of a parent or something like that will still be, there'll still be uh, an emotional value to that, but it'll, it won't be a reactivity, a re reactive uh, response. It'll just be uh, a, um, a more uh, calm and reflective kind of a, a response to, to remember those old things. It's that kind of reactivity part that's, that tells us when we've got stuff to work on. Yes. And we all have lots. It's, it's just the of nature course. of being human and, and, and this kind of life and this kind of collective consciousness and, and so on. And just yeah, our current time period is one that is um, rich with opportunity for, for resolution. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it, it's about recognizing that and because we can read certain scriptures and so on and so forth and, and you know, try to sort of mix, like mix mash things together and not understand the context uh of of where you know what how enlightenment is unfolding in our current time period but that's not always the most helpful you know there's a lot of value value to scripture but at the same time we have to look at how that value fits into our um to our current you know um appearance to our to our current situation and and currently we're sitting on a, a sort of a gold mine, if you look at it that way, of unresolved material, which has the potential to be used yeah. as that fuel, as that uh, as that uh, that that coal, which burns brightly in the fire of, of our of our commitment and and of our recognition of our blissful nature as as conscious awareness. Beautiful. No. Yeah. Beautiful. Yes. Um, yeah. Another little detail about the refinement part we were talking about earlier that's really valuable there, there's a the body has a refined substance uh, that it can produce called soma mm. which greatly enhances the uh refinement process and we've talked about that in in prior talks but it greatly re enhances the refinement process and um and that bring out the detail and and the ability to see the shadows and, and so on what's what's remaining um but soma it's it's uh recognizing soma and so on like that does require some value of refinement in and of itself uh, yes. because it is a very fine substance a pre, a pre kind of a pre-physical almost physical but not quite physical uh, substance hmm. and it has a a major role in in uh, the, the feminine side of unfolding yes yeah that's beautiful and it's also important to note that if someone you know, there can be, soma can be a part of the process and, and there does not be any context uh, for qualifying it. So someone could be unfolding in a, you know, in a certain context that maybe had never heard about soma, uh, its production, so on and so forth, but that's, it's going on. It would just be a matter of sort of aligning, aligning the language with their, with the experience. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and helping to support it. Yeah. yeah. And helping yeah, there's another, another detail too about energy healing that I think is worth mentioning, and that is the topic of empaths. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've explored this or, at all, but um, essentially about one in 20 people are born um, with a greater sensitivity to their mm -hmm. environment and to others. Now, there's many types of, of empath uh, gifts. Uh, some people are, are very attuned to others' emotions or to others' uh, thinking. Not in the sense of reading the mind, but in sort of the the, the overall uh, tone, um, mm. uh, the style of thinking that's going on, uh, or they're they're sensitive with they're they're quite uh, sensitive to uh, with animals or or gems, uh, you know, uh, minerals that kind of thing. Uh, there's quite a, a different uh, range of, of types, and it's beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. Uh, but essentially. If someone is empathic, then there's this tendency to pick up uh, information that way. And if they happen to be uh, emotional or, or intellectual empaths, um, then they're going to be influenced by other people. And in that sense, uh, it's important to become more conscious of, of that so that they avoid taking on other people's baggage. Because mm -hmm. it's very difficult to heal emotionally if you're constantly taking on other people's garbage. We have Quite enough of our own to deal with without taking on other people's stuff so that's a for from a healing uh context it's important to recognize um any particular sensitivities you might have and 
and make them a little more conscious so that your uh, those dynamics are not taking place. I mean, myself, um, uh, I kind of thought that empath was the last thing that I was. <laughs> it was too dense for that, but uh, it turned out that I was. And uh, what I didn't realize, it was completely uh, unconscious, it really surprised me, was that I was constantly reading my environment mm. and uh, and the people that were around me. You know, I'd be driving down the road, I'd be checking other drivers, what their state is and how they're doing. And in that process, I was, because it was unconscious and I wasn't skilled with energetically about it, I was taking on a bit of their stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, there's, an, there's the angry driver back there on the left. I, I got to be careful here. Um, and I was reacting to that, but it was all taking place on a subconscious level. So becoming conscious of that, then I avoided, uh, you know, pick, picking up the other. I can still be aware of it, but um, but not be picking up other people's stuff all the time and adding to my own baggage to, to deal with. Yeah, that's, I'm glad that you brought this up. Um, so I have a, uh, a particular perspective that I hold on it. And I've, I work with uh, many that might be considered empathic or have this uh, high sensitivity in, within the realm of uh, sort of uh, attunement to different emotional statuses, mental statuses, and environmental contexts, those, those sorts of things. What I found could, uh, can be potentially limiting about, about that um, about the sensitivity and then also about sort of the, the, the concept of the empath is that it could be taken on as a potentially sort of a victim, victim situation. Um, and that's not always going to be the case. You know, it just depends on how it's held. But when there's a tendency to, to, to feel as if it's always someone else's, you know, material that's, that's being processed out or, or something like that. And I can, I've seen the mind get involved in that. And the, what I refer to as the spiritual ego get involved in that and it can get pretty sticky. So in, yes. in the context of unfoldment, I tend to recommend, you know, that, well, of course we want to have an awareness of if we're, you know, kind of groping <laughs> for, for, for whatever, you know, and, and our own unconscious dynamics in, in turn, in, in reference to, to sort of exploring and those kinds of things, that's very, very appropriate and very, very important. At the same time, we can begin to develop a perspective um, as, as the truth of non-duality begins to shine forth that, you know, really what, what's being reflected back in the context of this body and mind to be processed out is not, is not being, um, is not necessarily coming from out there. And, and I think that that's one of the most healthy perspectives to have, particularly as, you know, the, the stages uh, continue to unfold, because as that refinement and that clearing begins to take place, very naturally, a, body, a nervous system, which is situated in a certain status and which is able, begins to sort of um, become a, a vehicle for, for certain levels of processing, which can be recognized to be more ancestral, more collective, more referential to gender identification, more referential to uh, perhaps environmental context, you know, those kinds of things. And that's a, that's a very appropriate, um, that's a very appropriate thing. It's very natural and spontaneous and, and in alignment with, with the healing of humanity. And so, it, just to have an awareness of the tendency to sort of get lost in the otherness, you know, and the, and yeah. the, uh, and, and the projection of that and the conclusion of that. And because really there can be a, a just a, it's a very fine line between differentiating where something is yours, you know, where, where and, and where it's someone else's. And I think that we all have something within us, which tends to lean on the side of it being someone else, someone else. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I say, well, just take response, you know, responsive, impersonal responsibility, you know, it's very helpful, but I totally uh, yeah. appreciate what you're saying and understand it's very, very important to have an awareness of those kinds of things. Yeah. And I think that when you get into uh, the further stages of enlightenment, where you yeah. become everything, yes. then, <laughs> then you, you definitely start processing uh, the collective. Yes. Um, but one of the really important things I, I realized about that is, is that we're, we tend to be tuned to certain mm. uh, things. Like yes. if we have a his, history of anxiety or jealousy, then and we've processed that, but we still have an a, a attunement to it in the yes. collective. 
So yeah. we're going to be more aware of that in the collective and we're going to have a greater ability to process that in the collective than someone who's <clears throat> got a background more with anger or something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So it kind of, there's, there's, a, there's a local attunement, uh, a, a, a skill we've got because we've learned to heal that, that arena. Um, yeah, that's a really beautiful point. It kind of goes back to the, the understanding of becoming specialists, you know, that, that within the mind of divinity, certain specialized ways of processing out material or areas of, of material that are being processed are sort of um, being aligned with, not, not by any sort of decision-making process, but just through the, the flow of experiencing and what we have tasted and, and what the impressions were in the context of a given body and mind. And how through healing that there's a comfort with healing that and and that translates into higher stages and so we may have a particular interest like one of my uh, one of the interests here that and and one of the main things that tends to sort of be processing out it has to do with male and female egoity and, and egoic dominance and the and the way that men and women relate to each other and how that relates to the masculine and the feminine uh, aspects of of conscious awareness so that you know it's just something that's there it doesn't mean that that's going to be in the foreground for everyone or something that's of interest yeah um, but it just it just depends on the case yeah. yeah i've actually been quite fascinated because um i've noticed that people who are get into um the so, uh, higher levels of enlightenment um they become quite distinctive in what their what their uh their gift areas are where they're focused and and um, and what they're developing, and mm -hmm. so it's quite interesting to compare notes because they'll they'll go into some detail about you know the structure of the universe, or they'll go into you know the mechanism for for using laws of nature to help uh, heal a, a large community, mm -hmm. or they'll you know there's just all kinds of different ways that that shows up and and. Uh, and I think it's always a surprise because even to the person that unfolds uh, for, <laughs> I mean, they may have they may have had a gift that they were aware of before, but it tends to flower. Or there's there can be gifts that were there that that were uh, essentially dormant or unconscious that come to the surface and and uh, find expression uh, when there's a, a clear vessel for that to to take place in. I think it's also important to to mention that that. Um, Enlightenment isn't isn't really a goal in itself. Hmm. Enlightenment is is a state of being. It's a it's a way of it's a, it's a way of living, and it has these advantages to live a better quality life. And that's what we're talking about here is is upgrading the quality of your life so that you 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 have a platform to live it from in a much more uh, enjoyable and satisfying uh, kind of way. Um, it's not just some elusive, uh, I mean, it has been for a long time, a, 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 a rare and, and uh, elusive kinds of, kind of thing, but that's not true anymore. There are many, many, many people who are waking now and, uh, and, and each of those are flowering in their own ways. It's quite beautiful to see. Yeah, it is really beautiful. And that's a really, really beautiful point. It kind of reminds me of when I, uh, when we first started doing these talks together, I, I mentioned to you, maybe the uh, us having a podcast together and for whatever reason at that time it just didn't seem like it was a good fit of course we've ended up sort of having a, having a sort of podcast in a way anyways um, but one of the the, the title uh, that I suggested was daily divinity and uh, that's really you know that really kind of sums it up it's not something that's kind of out there off on a mountaintop you know far away and and something to get to it's it's divinity in daily life you know it's it's realizing the truth of our divinity with 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 more depth more clarity um and and allowing that to express itself within the realm of 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 daily living and to reveal itself amidst all of these uh presentations of experience yes so it's uh it's about the appreciation for the process appreciation for the process and the willingness to for to allow life to be that to be that unfoldment to be that process to be that you know ever clarifying ever deepening richness of our of our being yes an upgraded life skill yeah it's yeah. beautiful beautiful there's one more thing i wanted to mention and it, you uh i couldn't remember it earlier when i was trying to think of it but 
just going back to the the tendencies of of the way in which certain material is processed out and there can be a tendency within the realm of the the mind and the ego and and the way in which experience is held to to feel that certain things are the the end of the world you know it's kind of there's a seriousness there can be an underlying uh false sense of seriousness surrounding certain things and and the accumulation of that energy as it surfaces can sometimes have an end of the world sort of <laughs> sense or flavor to it you know and it's not that 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 the that the heaviness or the stickiness as you said um, isn't there when we recognize it or when it comes up, but that we're able to to hold that uh, that that stickiness, that sludginess, that that end of the worldness in in the space of just gentle uh, receptive allowing, and and allow that that to process out um, without believing that it is something that it isn't, without becoming that. Yeah, not stepping it. into yeah not yeah. buying into it not stepping into it yes i i fully agree and it's a you know the experience here has been that there's some pretty mighty big things came to the surface at different mm -hmm. times that, that seemed almost overwhelming mm -hmm. and scary but i found that no matter how big and scary it seemed it was always possible to process it and always. the natural process here was only to bring up what was possible to to uh to process so if it's showing up then we're, yeah. we're ready to process it uh whether or not we feel that way you know that's another matter and so sometimes <laughs> sometimes we can be like okay this is a little too much and and we back off and 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 you know let it come back again uh, a bit later for more yeah. but um but yeah it's a it's a it's a bit of a dance sometimes uh, to get past our habits and our resistance and the mind trying to control and all that, all this kind of stuff. But over time, it just becomes almost uh, automatic. Yeah. You know, this stuff comes up and you've learned how to do it better. Yeah. And so it just automatically, it's just experienced the way it goes. And, and uh, there can be this idea that enlightenment means uh, everything's just peace and bliss all the time. And certainly those are there, but um, the emotions don't go away. There's still the full gamut of emotions, and in, in fact, uh, my experience has been that they're actually bigger and fuller than they ever were before. I can, you know, cry at a movie where I never was able to before, and, and just and it's just a real rich uh, uh, experience. I can get really angry, uh, and then it's just like, whoa, that was that was a lot, and then it's just <laughs> away it goes. It's gone. It's done. No no residue is left behind. Uh, so it's just this full um, richness that that it, it brings to the table. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a process. I sometimes, uh, use the example of the boogeyman thing. When we're a little kid, we can get into these real fears about the boogeyman under the bed or in the closet or, or something like that. I mean, there's a whole movie they did about <laughs> the monsters in the closet. Um, but the, um, um, the thing is when we were kids, it was a, it was a big thing, but now we're adults when that, when that old fear comes to the surface it'll come with that fear of oh the boogeyman of the bed but it was just a fear mm -hmm. it was just that's all it was there was never a, the boogeyman out of the bed and so it's just a it's just something to be uh, experienced and processed we're adults now we can handle it it's not a big deal but if we buy into that oh you know the scariness then then yeah then we're, then we can get lost in it so it's just, that's the key thing being just being able to see it without getting into it um, yes. And I've seen that done, you know, like I've seen techniques used uh, in groups um, like this one called family constellations. I saw it demonstrated one time and they basically invited the person to get into their drama and their story <laughs> to invest in it, to make it stronger, to make it more real that they were the victim. And I, and I was appalled. <laughs> and so I, I was like, no, this isn't this isn't it. This is not a good technique. But then later <laughs> on, then and later on, I saw the same technique, but used quite differently where they weren't inviting the person to, to invest in their story and that they were just and, you know, having people uh, experience what was there and allow it properly they understood the process better and it was used in a much more effective technique so that's yeah. the key I mean, when you're looking at any kind of you know energy healing or or similar techniques that are out there just watch it if it's it does it take you into the experience or does it take you into allowing the experience mm. you know and that that difference makes all the difference Yes.
yeah. because going into it just reinforces it. Whereas it's allowing, and of course, don't get in freaked out if you fall into the experience when it comes up sometimes, because there's kind of like, there's this dance. They talk about it in the Bhagavad Gita. The first part is you, you notice after the fact, oh, mm -hmm. I've, I got caught up in that again. I, I got angry about whatever and, or whatever it was. Um, and then the second part is we start to notice during. Mm -hmm. So we're right, right in the middle of it and we're like, oh, I've fallen into this. And mm -hmm. then we can kind of step back and change the direction of it a little bit. Yeah. And then finally, we notice when it's first coming up. Yes. And, some, and even before that, we're just the first impulse. It hasn't even come to the surface yet. Yeah. And then we have the potential to heal right on the level of that first impulse mm -hmm. before it even manifests as emotions and events and, and drama, and, you know, in, in, in your life, just on that sea level. Of course, some of the deeper shadows and stuff, it's hard to avoid that. They're still, they're still going to express in some kind of way. But then yeah. again, if we're, if we understand these basic principles, then uh, we can be with it with a bit of practice. It, this stuff takes practice, but with a practice, a little bit of practice, we, we get to familiar with the process and, and then it just becomes so much easier. Yeah. Yeah, really, really, really beautiful points. Uh, um, it's important to recognize too that even that, even when that stage where we're recognizing it, what appears to be after the fact, that's a very, very important stage, because it's a through reflecting on on that process and seeing where we bought into it, seeing where there was an identification, seeing where we became it, and we're acting it out. There's actually a clarification that's taking place and an undoing. So that the next it. time, yeah, 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 the next time that something similar arises, the likelihood of that same thing taking place decreases because we're bringing awareness. There's more conscious, uh, yeah. there's more light shining into that. And then, as you said, it becomes subtler and subtler, and a familiarity develops with the process. And then you you really made a wonderful point. I'm glad that you made it uh, before we finished. Um, surrounding the, you know, the resolution of that material in, in before it expresses within the field of activity, before it, before it surfaces and surfacing in, in the context of, you know, attentive allowing doesn't necessarily mean that anything is being acted out or, or that it's a drama. It can be just those subtle impulses, you know, the energy recognized in the body and, and, and different things expressed on what we might call a silent level. And, and someone, we can be with family, we can be somewhere, nobody else knows that it's going on, but there's a processing out of material. And, mm -hmm. and it's, this, uh, it's a beautiful opportunity for reflection, utilizing the sensory field. And as that resolution begins to take place, not only are those unconscious layers not expressing in the field of activity or the field of action, but also um, the karmic possibilities are transformed in the field of activity, in the field of action. And so, you know, when we resolve layers, our unresolved material surrounding money and surrounding, you know, dealings with money and lack and fear and all those different kinds of things, not to say that we're going to become millionaires or something like that, but the, the way in which the flow surrounding uh, the presentations of, of that aspect of experience is and is recognized changes. And so there's a greater degree of comfort, a greater degree of flexibility. And the way in which a certain experience would have unfolded if we hadn't resolved that material uh, now is no longer present. And so that experiencing can unfold in its highest possibility uh, because we've, we're attuned to resolving those layers prior to them expressing in the field of behavior, in the field of, of action. Yes, there's yeah. a sufficiency that arises to that example. And yes. actually in all areas of life, but financially and, and relationships and so on like that, we can mm -hmm. be in relationships without, you know, being this thing for acting out our garbage. Yeah. Um, it, it can actually just be a relationship be between two souls. Yeah. And the relationship actually can serve the process of resolution. So it can actually oh, yes. become a service vehicle where there's an, a, an underlying commitment to the reflection and the intelligence and conscious awareness, which is utilizing that dynamic in the direction of clearing. And yes. as there's clearing, of course, there's more richness, more fullness in the dynamic. And that supports the, the willingness to look at deeper, darker layers. And then that becomes more richness, more fullness, more bliss, more intimacy, so on and so forth. So it's, it, it's just vast, uh, our potential and, and the possibility of human life when we 
when we are attuned uh, to these principles and we have that uh, that willing heart and and uh, a childlike uh, simplicity when it comes to these things. Yes. And one more thing uh, I'll say about about this is that your example of the of the boogeyman um, reminded me of the the possibility that in in certain things surfacing sometimes uh, the the sensory perception can be colored. And so that the what we're seeing or hearing actually sort of is influenced by um, a certain emotion or a certain uh, energetic presence, and and potentially can be dis distorting the sense the sense faculties, um, and and of course the thought the thought processes. So it's it's helpful to recognize that um, you know during purification during uh, you know if if there's something processing out. Just to have that awareness that perhaps sensory perception is being colored, you know, um, in in a certain direction. It's not a it's not a safety feature. It's not an attempt to control. Just just wisdom and and having that awareness because it does take place, um, as we know from from lying in the you know lying in the bed as a child with the heartbeat like this, and uh, you know you're looking at the closet door and you see little something something's in there moving around. <laughs> you know the the senses are colored by that fear. Uh, yes. Of course, when you get up and go to the closet and turn the lights on, nothing's there. Yeah. Yeah. But if you lay in the bed, the the whole story, the whole the conscious awareness begins to reflect what it's believing in. Yeah. And the Yoga Vaishishta, you know, makes that point so many times that you know whatever the conscious awareness holds holds within itself, whatever it, it takes itself to be, that is what appears. Yeah. That yes. that is what seems to be going on. Yeah, snake and string analogy. Yeah, is yeah, a, that's is a it. Common one. Yeah. Seeing the in the dark, seeing the string as a snake. Mm -hmm. No, um, it's 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 fascinating because it's a it's a fundamental dynamic in the way we live life. Mm. It's a uh, it's so uh, this can make such a difference in in life. I mean, I'm just just gradually over time, I've, I've been watching just things simplifying. Mm. The mind gets quieter. The emotions get become more settled. Fuller and richer, but most of the time, much more settled. Yes. Life gets less eventful because there's mm -hmm. no, there's fewer things to rise to the surface to be processed. Mm -hmm. uh, and when things do come up uh, that need to be completed, uh, everything that's needed to complete the process is there. Just yeah. everything just kind of organizes, you know. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I mean, an example that comes to mind is is I driving home from a late movie one one night um, a few years ago now. But um, I was driving home and one of my tires blew out for no reason. I couldn't figure out why it blew out uh, <laughs> afterwards looking at it. And uh, so I'm in this, uh, in this place, an uh, unlit highway in the middle of nowhere. Um, but it actually wasn't very far from where I lived. So um, I thought about getting out and changing the tire in the dark. <laughs> I thought, oh, no, this isn't worth it. The tire is gone. So I just drove home really slowly on the on the on the on the road thrashed rubber trying not to damage the uh, rim and then uh, the next morning I, I called up to find out who had who carried that kind of tire and it was like half a mile away mm. um, I changed the tire over took it in they, they replaced they had one in stock or they had two, actually got two uh, they had two in stock so it was all taken care of just quick 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 very easy and whereas you know historically I can recall similar kinds of things where it's like uh, it's just a big drama and it just yeah. goes on and on and doesn't want to finish and uh, you know this kind of thing um, but when you're cooperating with life then li life can cooperate back and support you and it just works uh, so much more simply yeah yeah great example that's it we're just attuned to that support to the to those laws of nature those aspects of ourself and and in a certain sense you know that 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 kind of uh, experience becomes commonplace, you know, just for the things to flow more fluidly, for there to be less uh, seeming interruption, for for certain things to come together organically, naturally, spontaneously. No need to to force, no need to try, you know, because we we have seen that we are life and we are one with life, and and that recognition of the oneness of life begins to express itself in that flow, in that in that sense of just a, 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 a seamlessness, you know, and, and when little things bubble up and are processed out, it's just right back, 
you know, it just kind of serves deepening in that, in that sense of flow and that sense of fullness. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. Well, I think we've covered uh, quite a bit. So I want to thank you again for taking the time to, uh, to chat with me about this. And um, I'll look forward to seeing what our, what our next conversation will be on. Yes. So uh, we give all glory to, to pure divinity. All glory to pure divinity. Thank you, David. <laughs>